السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين قال الله في كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان في يوسف وإخوته آيات للسائلين صدق الله العلي العظيم وصل على محمد وآل محمد Chapter number 12 in the Quran, Surah Yusuf, is said to have been revealed when a group of the people of the book requested from the Meccan idolaters, the polytheists, to request of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to recite to them the story of the Prophet Yusuf. And thus the revelation was sent down in this form. And if you look at the Judeo-Christian tradition, it corresponds with the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis chapters 37 to 42. Of course, there are differences in the Islamic account versus the Judeo-Christian account. And it's one of the only chapters that narrates the story of an individual any individual um, chronologically so there is a sequence much like a normal story is told whereas if you examine the stories of the other prophets such as the prophet Ibrahim or the prophet Musa or the prophet Isa you'll find bits and pieces in different chapters most of the story of the prophet Yusuf and he is mentioned in other chapters, but most of the story is mentioned in chapter number 12, Surat Yusuf. And in the Islamic tradition, much of the artistic, the literary, and the spiritual tradition found within the Islamic tradition is inspired by the story of the Prophet Yusuf. Because it's a story of patience. It's a story of forbearance. It's a story of love and compassion. And most of all, it's a story of good leadership. Because if you examine the life of the Prophet Yusuf, you would find that whether he was in the dredges of a jail, or whether he was in the darkness, in the depth of a well, or whether he was sitting on the throne, or whether he was an administer, he was consistent in his belief. He was consistent in his behavior. And he was consistent in his attitude. And that right there is the sign of a true leader. It's the measure of a true leader. And so it, it presents to us a, a very beautiful story. Yusuf السلام, throughout, throughout his story, we notice that, that his attitude and his consistency in his behavior and his faith is what allowed him to transcend his situation and understand the role that God had intended for him to play. And most of us, when God created us, you know, God did not create us as human beings to be followers. God created us to be leaders. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, when He speaks to the angels, He says, Inni Ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I am creating a khalifa. A khalifa is one who is, is, the literal meaning of the word khalifa is a successor, meaning one who is to be followed. So all of us have leadership skills. Some people within their lifetime, they realize their leadership skills and some people, they do not realize their leadership skills for whatever reason, for whatever circumstance. Now, the Qur'an teaches us about leadership. It says that there are good leaders and there are bad leaders. There are leaders 
A'imma who invite to the hellfire. Yad'una ila nar And there are leaders on the other hand who yahduna bi amrina. They guide towards our command and towards our path. So when you say leadership, sometimes when you use the word leadership, people assume that, you know, the, 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 the first thing that comes to mind is a boss or a manager, which to an extent is true because part of leadership is authority. But more than authority, leadership is influence, knowing how to influence and lead people. And so some, some people, they give out negative influence and some people, they give out positive influence. So there's, there's, a, there's a quote by um, uh, Peter Drucker, who is the, uh, of the father of modern business management. He says, if you, if you look at, if you examine the three most influential leaders of the 20, 20th century, the three most influential leaders are uh, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and Mao Zedong. He says, if that's leadership, then I want nothing to have to do with leadership. So when we say leadership, the word leadership, it's free of merit and it's free of value. So you can have good leaders and you can have bad leaders. It's all about the influence that you put out there in the world, whether you put positive influence or negative influence. So each and every one of us, we are either leading other people or we are being led in some way, shape or form. And that's why it's important, brothers and sisters, especially at a young age, to realize that you are in control of how you are being influenced and how you are being led. And that's directly related to the people that you associate with and what you're putting in your mind, what you're listening to on a daily basis. What are you watching on TV? What are you reading when you're scrolling through social media? What are you watching? All of that is influencing you. See, here you live in a society where you're free to choose your association. I mean, nobody puts a gun to your head and says that um, you have to hang out with this person, right? I, I mean, I, I hope that's not the case, where you're forced to hang out with your group of friends. You're free to pick whatever friends you want. You're completely free to do that. Most people pick friends or their association based off of some shared interests, common interests. So if you play a certain sport, or now it's not so much sports, if you play a certain video game, you could find someone who lives across the world and you don't even speak the same language, but because both of you play Fortnite, all of a sudden you're best buddies, you're best friends. So you're allowed to pick your association. You're free to choose that. However, understand that once you pick your association, you do not pick the influence. You do not choose whether that person influences you or, not inf or does not influence you. What does that mean? Sometimes, you know, we're, we're very good-hearted people. So we'll hang out with the wrong crowd and we'll say, you know what, I'm not gonna get influenced by this person. Or you'll listen to something that you shouldn't be listening to and you'll say, you know what, I'm not gonna be influenced by this. I can rise above this. The people who music is haram for are, are, are the people that they get influenced by it. I can't get influenced by it. I don't get influenced by it. Or if you're watching a certain TV show, or if you're reading something on social media, it's very, very important that you pick exactly where you are, your position. Because once you pick the people that you associate with, and sometimes, by the way, association doesn't mean physically the group of people that you're hanging out with. If you're listening to people in pop culture, on social media, it's like you're hanging out with that person. So once you pick your association, you don't pick the influence. So sometimes you can have bad influence in your life. Some people, they ask themselves or they, or they wonder, why, why am I not able to accomplish anything in life? Well, have you ever done an audit of your association, what you're listening to, the people that you're hanging out with? Sometimes the people that you're hanging out with, they're going nowhere at Mach 5 speeds. And so if you're associating with those type of people, you need to understand that the influence, it happens automatically, whether you choose it or you don't choose for it to happen. So even though you don't choose the influence, however, you can choose the association, and that's the good news. So leadership is not so much about position and authority, it's more about influence. Sometimes 
There are people who are in a position of authority, they're in a position of influence, but they actually have no influence. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever you know, seen at the, at the workplace that boss or that manager that nobody really likes and nobody listens to? They're in a position of leadership, but they're not in a, they have no influence among the people. Or that teacher or the principal of the school who no one really likes and no one really wants to listen to. They're appointed to a position of leadership. However, they don't actually have influence on their students, on their employees, on their subordinates. So leadership is not so much about position. It's more about influence. On the other side, you can have people who are not appointed to a position of, in, a, a position of leadership, however they have influence. If you've noticed, in, and that's how it works out most of the time in government and in politics. I was, I was just reading an article, and uh, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a gentleman, without mentioning names of people or names of governments or names of countries, but uh, he's a casino mogul that lives in Las Vegas. And uh, multi, multi-billionaire. And he's a very uh, outspoken supporter of a certain government. It's not the United States government. It's, it's a government in the Middle East, okay? And uh, with his buying power, he's able to contribute tens of millions of dollars to um, certain lobbyist groups in order to sway public opinion. And, and this person was one of the most uh, form, uh, foremost supporters of the decision to move the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And he was able to do that because he had money. Now, again, he doesn't have, he's not the President of the United States, but he's able to influence the President of the United States. He's not the leader of the Republican or the Democratic Party, but he's able to influence those parties through the millions of dollars that he spends. So that's leadership right there, meaning that he has influence, even though he's not appointed to a position of authority. So having said that, knowing that leadership comes from influence, when you study the life of the Prophet Muhammad or the lives of any other of the Prophets or any one of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, you find that even though during their life, they may or may not have been appointed to a position of authority, however they were in influence. That's why what's so beautiful about the story of the Prophet Yusuf السلام, is that even though before he became the administrator, because there was a time where he was not the administrator, there was a time that he was purchased, he was sold and purchased into slavery, where he found himself in the home of the Aziz, and the Aziz was the uh, he, he was the, the sort of like what you would have today, a prime minister. Not the king, but the prime minister. He found himself in his home as a slave at the wills of Zuleikha, the wife of the Aziz. Even there, he showed influence, even though he was not the minister at the time. So there was, there was a period of time in order to assume the role of leadership that he had to really build himself. And so if you ever aspire to be in a position of leadership, again, when we talk about leadership, we're not talking about a position. I'm not talking about you aspire to be a boss or a manager or a CEO. If you want that, that's okay, you can do that. But if you aspire to be a person of influence, when you grow up and you get married, you wanna be a person of influence in your household, upon your spouse, upon your children. See, what we're missing today and why so many families fall apart is because there isn't enough leadership. There isn't enough influence. You find a family where the father does not know how to lead. The mother does not know how to lead. The siblings, the older siblings who should be in an influential position, they cannot do that. When you grow up and you create your own family, what do you want? Do you want to be another statistic or do you want to be among the people who are influential? You want influence. But in order to create influence, you have to work on yourself. 
And that's exactly what the story of the Prophet Yusuf السلام, teaches us. Now, just a few lessons to learn. Number one, we need to understand that no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, no matter how influential you think you are or you think you're not, and no matter how influential you actually are or you actually are not, that each and every single one of us are in a position of leadership. And that's what the Prophet Yusuf taught us. What does that mean? You know, there's, there's, this, there's this common theme, and you've probably heard this statement before. And the theme is, of, is do anything that you want as long as you're not hurting anybody. You heard that one before? Do anything that you want as long as you're not hurting anybody. Now, you know, most people who say that are very well-intentioned. Sometimes you may hear that from a teacher or a parent or um, someone, who is, someone who is in a position of authority or influence in the community. And again, influence can be positive or it could be negative. So when we say influence, it could also be negative influence. You may hear that sometimes. Do anything, as you want, do anything that you want as long as you're not hurting anyone. Now what's the issue with that statement? First of all, who is to determine what hurt is? When you say as long as you're not hurting anyone, who determines that? I mean, is there like, is there a council, like a council of hurt determination or something like that, that determines what hurt actually is? And then who determines if you're actually hurting other people or not hurting other people. See, what we assume when we say do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting anyone is that nobody's watching. However, as a believer, deep down within your conscious, we believe that at every moment somebody is watching us. Somebody is looking up to you. Now, number one, we believe that God is watching us. Now, God, God is not influenced by our actions. So you don't negatively influence God and you don't positively influence God. However, it's important to understand that there is at least one being at every time and in every place that's watching over you. Again, it's narrated from the life of the Prophet Yusuf. And this is a very interesting story. It says that his father, Yaqub, one day gathered his sons, all of his sons, and Yusuf was one of many sons, and, and we know that he was the favorite son of his father. So it was asked one day to his father, why is it that Yusuf was your favorite son? I mean, was he, was he the tallest one? I mean, was he the one that can, was he, was he the only one that can, you know, uh, dunk a basketball, or did he have good cooking skills? What, what is it that made him stand out that you favored him so much? Because the Quran says that when he lost his son, he wept until he lost his eyesight. So he lost his eyesight. What is it that favored? He said that one day I gathered my sons. Now listen to this story, it's important. He said, one day I gathered my sons and I gave them a task. I told them, I want you each to gather a small animal, a, a bird or a chicken or whatever, Find a place where you have total privacy, where no one's watching over you, and slaughter it, and come back to me. So all of them went out, they found the animal, they found the bird or the chicken or whatever it was, they slaughtered it, and they came back to the father, except for Yusuf, he was the only one. So when his father turned to him, he said, Yusuf, why did you not, why didn't you not carry out the task? He said, my father, he said, you asked us to go somewhere where nobody can watch us. Nobody can see us. Everywhere that I went, I realized that there was a being that was watching over me. And that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everywhere. So from that young age, he exhibited an understanding of God consciousness. He knew that God was watching him at every time. So his favor wasn't, again, it wasn't because of his good looks or because of anything else, even though he... He, ha he definitely had the good looks. But that wasn't why his father favored him. His father favored him because he expressed God consciousness. He knew that God was watching over him. 
When you know that God, at least God is watching over you, you understand that you have a responsibility to adjust your behavior. And so not only is it that God is watching over you, but people are watching over you. Your siblings are watching. Your cousins are watching. Your friends are watching. All of them are watching your behavior. So when you say, do whatever you want, as long as you don't hurt anybody, well, what if you do something that you assume is not hurting anyone, but because somebody else, a younger sibling or a younger cousin or a younger brother or a younger classmate is watching, you negatively influence that person and thus you've hurted them. You've hurt them. What if that's the case? And that happens, brothers and sisters, when we understand that our deeds, all of our deeds, they have two sides to them. There's two sides to the coin. There's a visible side and there is an invisible side. There is one side that is seen and felt and heard and then there is another side which is not immediately feel, uh, felt, seen, or heard. And the Qur'an proves that to us. The Qur'an, the Qur'an proves to us that there is a side to our deeds which is not manifested right away. It doesn't happen immediately. Sometimes it manifests itself many years later. Sometimes it manifests itself many generations later. Sometimes it manifests itself in the barzakh and in the afterlife. Sometimes it manifests itself within our children. And there are many, many, many examples of that. One example is what we consume, what we eat. So, you know, when you decide to, 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 to go to um, Burger King, and what do they have? What's it? The, the Whopper, right? The Big Mac is McDonald's. Burger King has the Whopper. And you decide, you know what? I'm not going to hurt anybody. So you, so, so you get one of those and you, you bite into it. So the first feeling initially is, this is, it's a juicy burger, it's delicious. Now here in the Northeast, you're very, very lucky because you have halal food all around. So you don't need to do any of this. Consider yourself very blessed. There are parts of the United States and Canada, there's no halal food. So, so this is just a very, very theoretical example. This is an encouragement, please understand this. First, you think, okay, well, this is delicious. And you don't see an apparent effect. Immediately you don't see the effect. But there is an unseen side to your actions. Once you place it into your stomach and once it goes into your system. Narrations tell us that if you have haram food in your system, what happens? For 40 days, your supplication is not heard by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now think about it. I mean, you're all Western educated, right? Um, you know, you're, you're taught here to, to, to think freely, to question everything. Let's take a few steps back before that, before that burger was actually a burger. It started off as a live animal. You know that, right? A live animal with a face, with, with, uh, with a family, right? It's, it's, it started somewhere, okay? It had a family, a farm that it was raised on. It was stripped away from its family for, for your pleasure, for your satisfaction. Imagine you have two animals that are about to be slaughtered. Two sheep or two cows that are about to be slaughtered. All of the requirements for it to be halal have been met in both of them. Except for one of them, the slaughterer does not say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So they're purchased with halal money, they're placed on the qibla, they're given water. They're, they're being slaughtered by a Muslim, except for the fact that in one of them, the slaughterer forgets to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What happens? It's no longer, it's not halal meat. One of them is halal, the other one is not halal. What is it about this two statement, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, that completely changes the situation with this meat and not with that meat? There is an unseen, unfelt aspect to it. And a condition of being a believer, in the Qur'an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif la meem, thalika al-kitab la rayba fihi hudan lil-muttaqeen, alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. The believers are whom? Before talking about the zakat, and the fasting, and the prayers, and the hajj, and all of the ritual stuff that we, we said last night, all the quote-unquote the religious stuff, the ritual, archaic stuff, before that is yu'minuna bil ghayb, meaning that they believe in the unseen. Meaning that they understand that 
when you're, when, you're, when you're committing yourself to a deed, an action, it's not only what you see with your eyes. There's an unseen aspect to it. And some of those unseen, invisible aspects, some of them they manifest in this life, some of them they manifest in the barzakh, and some of them manifest in the akhirah. I'll give you an example. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, He warns us, He says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ أَمْوَالَ الْيَتَامَ ظُلْمًا إِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُونَ فِي بُطُونِهِمْ نَارًا وَسَيَصْلَوْنَ سَعِيرًا That those people who unjustly consume the wealth of the orphans, and this was a, a problem at the time when the verses were revealed. Now back then they didn't have the foster care home system. You know, they didn't have social security or welfare to look after children who had been orphaned. These days, God forbid, when a child becomes uh, an orphan or if they're raised in an abusive home, there's another home to take care of them. There's a system that can take care of them. Back then, there was no such system. I mean, you were lucky to be passed on to merciful relatives. And maybe even today, if you've, if you've heard in some countries back home, still in the Middle East, there is no proper system if a child becomes an orphan, sometimes they're left at the mercy of the not-so-merciful society that they're a part of, or not-so-merciful family members. Maybe some of you have heard some of those horror stories I've, I've heard myself. So back then they didn't have that. So a common theme, a common problem at the time was children who would become orphans and then their money, their wealth was misused by the people that would take them in. So the Qur'an says, it warns us, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ أَمْوَالَ الْيَتَامَىٰ ظُلْمًا إِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُونَ فِي بُطُونِهِمْ نَارًا وَسَيَصْلَوْنَ سَعِيرًا Those who consume unjustly the wealth of the orphans, what are, what's going on? They are consuming fire in their stomachs. وَسَيَصْلَوْنَ سَعِيرًا And they will also be punished by the fire on the Day of Judgment. Meaning there, there are two things going on, not one. Not that they do it now and then they feel it in the hereafter. No, they do it now and there's an effect right now. They are actually consuming fire in their stomachs. The only difference is they can't feel the heat of that fire right now. It's not manifest right now. But it is fire that is being consumed in their stomachs. So what does that mean? That means that there is something which is actually going on right now, but it's invisible. It's unseen. It's unfelt. And the Quran says on the Day of Judgment that all of those things that either you felt or you did not feel, you saw or you did not see, they were visible or invisible. يَوْمَ تَجْدُ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا عَمِلَتْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ مُحْضَرًا وَمَا عَمِلَتْ مِنْ سُوءٍ On that day, on the day of judgment, every soul, every nafs, shall see with its eyes all of the good and the bad that it did. It will be muhdar, meaning that it will be present in front of you. Meaning that even though it was invisible in this life, on that day it's very visible. فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حديد. On that day, the ghita, meaning the veil, the hijab, it's been lifted from the eyes. And you can see 20-20 vision. You know, in this world, as human beings, there are certain things that exist that we can't see, right? I mean, you can't see ultraviolet waves. You can't see infrared waves with your naked eye. Um, I mean, if, if, if there's anyone that's out there that can do that, please let me know. I'd like an interview. But normal human beings, you, you, there, there are certain things that you simply can't see. It's been veiled from your eyes. For whatever reason, there are certain things that you cannot hear, you cannot listen to. There are certain wavelengths that animals can listen to. Dogs and cats and dolphins and snakes and whatnot. But as a human being, you, you don't have the, you know, the, the radio that's in your mind, it, it doesn't tune in to that frequency. On the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you can tune into all of the frequencies. فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ It's been lifted. فَوَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ You have iron vision on that day, meaning that it's, it's sharp. You can see everything. On the other side, there are good deeds that we do. So there's, there's, there's good news as well. There are good deeds that you do in this world, you don't see them right away, but you will see them where? In the grave. Alamul Barzakh. There's one narration, and there are different variations of this narration. It says the following. It says that 
when a mu'min, when a believer enters his grave. There are six things which enter the grave with you. And it's not Gucci and Prada and <laughs> Yeezys and Supreme, okay? It's, it's none of that. There are six things that enter the grave. What are they? Number one is Salah, your prayer. Remember that, this prayer that you're offering in this world, that you might not feel the effect of it right away. It's okay, it's okay. Look, everybody struggles with their prayers. Everybody struggles. I remember I was sitting in front of a scholar one time and a young man came to him and he said to him, he said, Sayyidina, I have a question to ask you. He says, what is it? He says, I'm struggling. He says, what are you struggling with? He says, I'm struggling with concentration in my prayers. He says, do you have a remedy? Do you have a solution? So, so the scholar said to him, he said, if you have an answer, tell me, because I'm also struggling myself. So now that doesn't mean that, of course, there, there are ways that we can prepare ourselves so that we have optimum focus in our prayers. But look, everybody struggles at one point of another. It, it doesn't matter whether you're Sayyid, non-Sayyid, scholar, non-scholar, beginner, intermediate, advanced. Everybody struggles. And you may not see the effect right away of your prayer. But the narration says that that's one thing that enters the grave. Salah, that's number one. Psalm, your fasting. Many of you who are beginning fasting right now, you're beginning fasting in the summer months. There's good news. There's going to be a time in a few years where you're going to be fasting in the winter. It's going to be much, much easier. Okay, when we began fasting, it was in the winter. So it's much, much easier. So your psalm, that's one of them. Hajj, your pilgrimage. And my advice to you, brothers and sisters, the younger you are, the better it is to perform the hajj. Because the more energy that you will have and the more blessings that will come into your life. Hajj, that's the third thing. So we have salah, psalm, hajj, zakat. Zakat is what? Zakat is all of the, all of the charity that you give. All the charitable contributions that you give. And sometimes you can't give money because maybe you're living at home and you know, you're not working a job yet, you're not bringing in an income. One way to be charitable is with your time. If you can volunteer your time, your time is also a very valuable asset that you own. So zakat. Another one is your birr. Your birr is your benevolence, your virtue, your goodness to people. Another one is your wilaya. Wilaya is, 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 is your belief in the Ahlul Bayt salam. So these are things that enter the grave. And what happens when they enter the grave? They take a physical manifestation. And the narration says that each one of these things, they protect you from the front and back. So there's six things. One from the front, one from the back, two from the sides, one from the top, and one from the bottom. And every time the punishment is to come your way, every time the angels punish, because we, we also believe in adab al-qabr, there's punishment in the grave, there's accountability in the grave. Every time punishment is to come your way, these things will protect you. It's like a soldier that's standing in front of you. A warrior standing in front of you. Each one of these deeds takes the manifestation of a warrior and it blocks with its shield, it protects. Every single time the punishment is to come to your way. So the stronger those deeds are in this world, the stronger they are in the grave. The weaker they are, if you have a salah that lasts 30 seconds, well, you're gonna have a soldier that's limping, he's got a cast on, he, he, you know, doesn't, he's missing a tooth, and uh, he's uh, four feet tall, and he doesn't know how to use his sword and his shield. Those are all invisible effects, but they are effects nonetheless. So simply because you don't see the effect of something in this world does not mean that it doesn't exist. That's why, now going back to the issue of leadership, going back to that question of do anything that you want as long as you're not hurting anyone. Well, who says, what, now when you take that into consideration, that your deeds, they go beyond just their physical and their visible presence, their tangible presence. They venture into an invisible and an intangible presence. 
That means that we have to watch what we do, even when we are alone. And that's where taqwa plays an important role. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <coughs> so understand that as leaders, people are always watching you. See, Yusuf, going back to the story of Yusuf, when he was tempted by Zulaikha to commit adultery, to fornicate with him, he was alone in the room. He could have said, well, no one's watching. The minister is not watching. The king is not watching. There's no paparazzi following around. There certainly wasn't any annoying paparazzi following around. There weren't no you know, news reporters trying to sneak in. You know, every time uh, I'm from Los Angeles, so every time I, I fly out of LAX or land into LAX, there's always paparazzi. They're waiting there. And I always tease them. I ask them, you know, have you caught anything? You've caught anything? Is there anything interesting? And most of the time it's a no. They're waiting. Right? And we, you live in an ma- age of, of mass media and mass communication. You know, as soon as the, you capture something, you can, a million or 10 million or 100 million people see it across the world. Well, that didn't exist back then. I mean, Yusuf could have, he could have done it. He could have done the deed quietly and nobody would have seen. But he understood that even if nobody is watching, there is somebody watching. And eventually my behavior will affect the people around me. And that's why when his brothers came back at the end of the story, they saw him in a position of true influence, of true authority, of true power. God granted him that. Why? Because he had worked on himself. He didn't say, well, you know what? Nobody's watching right now. See, character, your true character is built when nobody's watching. That's when your true reputation is built. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifted him to those ranks. He says, يَرْفَعُ دَرَجَاتٍ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifts to the ranks, to the positions of influence. He who he loves, he who he desires. So understand that people are always watching. And we're taught that in the Qur'an. In the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the wives of the Prophet. He says, يَا نِسَاءَ النَّبِيِّ مَنْ يَأْتِ مِنْ كُنَّ بِفَاحِشَةٍ مُبَيِّنَ يُضَاعَفْ لَهَا الْعَذَابُ ضَعْفَيْنِ وَكَانَ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرًا He says, O wives of the Prophet, O women of the Prophet, understand that if any one of you were to disobey, that it would be counted twicefold against you. Why? People are watching you. You are not like any other of the women. The verse says, يَا نِسَاءَ النَّبِيِّ لَسْتُنَّ كَأَحَدٍ مِّنَ النِّسَاءِ إِنَ التَّقَيْتُنَ that if you have taqwa, then you are not considered like any of the other women. You're in a different position. People are watching you. So if you disobey, you're held, it's held against you twofold. And the opposite is also true. That if you obey and if you do good and you set a good example, a righteous example, then you are also rewarded twice. Because people are watching you. Because you are, you are in a position of influence. You are in a position of authority. It's important to understand, brothers and sisters, that we are all in a position of influence by default. As a Muslim living in a majority non-Muslim society, people are watching you. People are waiting to scrutinize you. People are waiting to criticize you. People are waiting to vilify you. But at the same time, there are people who are waiting to honor you. People that are willing to be inspired by you. Have you noticed that sometimes whenever, a, you know, when a Muslim does something bad, it's, you're vilified in the media, automatically. However, sometimes when a Muslim does something good, it's also shown in the media. So you're, you're automatically put in a position of scrutiny. People are going to watch you. And Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, and these are the nights that we commemorate the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He, understand what it, he understood what it meant to be a leader to his core. During one of his final sermons, he stood in front of the people. And he said to the people, he said, Oh people, he said, There has never been something that I have called you to, commanded you to, to do, that I have not already practiced myself. And there is nothing that I have for, forbidden you from doing that I have not already forbidden myself from doing. And he was living at a time of such irony. He says that usually, 
in the political arena, in the political game, the political situation, it's usually the leader who is oppressing his people, who is oppressing his followers. But in my situation, it is the leader who is being oppressed by his followers. You know that Amir al-Mu'mineen would walk in the streets of Kufa, and some of his staunchest enemies were in the city of Kufa, and they would not even say salamun alaykum to him. And this is the leader of the Muslims. How ironic was it? He would turn to the people, he would say, he'd, he'd say this to the followers of Muawiyah, and he would say to his own people. He would say, look, he says, that commander has disobeyed Allah and you obey him. And your commander has obeyed Allah and you disobey him. What kind of irony is this? And really that's where the tragedy was in the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Is that he lived during a time of irony. People were confused. And this is Amir 40 years after the life of the Prophet. Less than 40 years after the life of the Prophet. And Amir al-Mu'mineen had to bear all of that. And it weighed down on him. But that did not, you know, he didn't say, you know what, I'm tired of being a leader today. Maybe these people, maybe they don't deserve my leadership. Maybe they, they don't deserve that I guide them. Even during his final moments, after he was struck down on the night of the 19th of Ramadan, after the poison began to seep into his body, he still filled his role as a leader. He still turned to his people. He still, he still told them, Ask me before you lose me. Ask me on the pathways of the universe. Is'aluni an turuq al-sama' fa wallah inni a'lamu biha min turuq al-ard. Ask me about the pathways of the universe. For I am more knowledgeable about them than the pathways of the earth. Meaning that I am more knowledgeable about what is going on in the unseen world and in the unseen realm than what you understand to be true in the seen, visible, felt realm tangible realm. Ask me before you lose me. And then he turned towards his sons, Al-Hasan wal Hussein alayhum salam and he began to admonish them, he began to advise them. He says to them, أُوصِيكُمَا بِتَقْوَى اللَّهِ وَنَظْمِ أَمْرِكُمْ I advise you to have taqwa, to have God consciousness, and to place your affairs in order. Organize your affairs, be organized people. And then he begins to give them, give them the wasiyah. Allah, Allah bil Qur'an. Take care of the Qur'an. Memorize the Qur'an. Practice the Qur'an. Behave the way the Qur'an wants you to behave. Allah, Allah fi salah. Take care of your prayer. فَإِنَّهَا عَمُودُ الدِّينَ It is the pillar that holds up your faith. Allah, Allah bil aytam. Take care of the orphans after me. The people that have no protectors. Amir al Mu'mineen. Yes, he was, he, was, he was fierce on the battlefield. No one, can, no one can tame him on the battlefield. No one can face him on the battlefield. But part of his leadership is that he had a very soft side. See, he knew how to balance between being harsh on the battlefield, where it counted, where bravery really counted, where commitment really counted. And at the same time, he knew how to have a soft side for the people that were oppressed. And he would say to his sons in that very same wasiyah, "Kuna lilzalimi khasma, walilmazlumi auna." He says, "Whenever you see an oppressor, be the enemy of the oppressor. Hold enmity against the oppressor. And when you ever come across the oppressed, be their partner, be their defender, come to their aid." And at the center of that were the orphans. Because many people throughout the many years of battle and during the three civil wars that were fought during his time, they had lost their fathers. Many children had become orphans. So Amir al-Mu'mineen had took it upon himself. He had made, made it a personal task, a mission, a responsibility to go out and take care of the orphans. And on that night when the Amir was struck down, there was no one else to take care of the orphans. So he told his sons Al-Hasan wal Hussein, Allah, Allah bil aytam Take care of the aytam take care of the orphans. And so the orphans on that night, they lined up at the home of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Because after, after the many months and the many weeks, the many years that the Amir, Amir had 
taken care of them after he had fed them. Narrations say that they had also showed up as a sign of gratitude, as, as a sign of gift. They showed up with food and they showed up with milk in order to give to him, in order to now reciprocate that and come to his aid. When, when, when Amir al-Mu'mineen, when, when he realized that it was his final moments, he gathered his closest people to him. He wept. When they brought to him something to drink, what did he do? As a sign of his mercy, he turned, he said, go to the captive Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. Imagine, imagine the heart that he had in order to, to do this. He said, go to him, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, the man who only a few hours earlier had struck him down in his prayer. He said, make sure that he has something to drink. Make sure he has something to eat. When he saw that the ropes were tied into his arm and they were digging into his arm, he told the captors, he said, loosen them up. He said, do not be harsh. He turned to his son Al-Hasan. He said, if you, are, if you make the choice of striking him in the same way that he has struck me, فواحدة. He tells him, strike him only one time because he only struck me down one time. Do not strike him more than one time. If he dies, do not mutilate his body. As much as your emotions may push you to do that, remember, people are watching. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. Don't allow your emotions to get out of hand. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we allow our emotions to take the best of us. Maybe someone in our family circle, maybe someone in our friend circle, they oppress us in, in, in some way. Maybe they've said something to us. Maybe they physically oppressed us. Remember that if no one is there to come to your aid, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. Inna rabbaka labil mirsad. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he understood this principle to its core. And so if we were to follow in his footsteps, let us at least follow with that example. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us his mercy and his forgiveness and his compassion in this holy month, in the last few nights of this holy month. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us in this holy month. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our a'mal in this holy month. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring relief and aid to all of those worldwide who are in need of our supplication. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma ghfir lil-mu'minina wal-mu'minati wal-muslimina wal-muslimat al-ahyai minhum wal-amwat. Taba' baynana wa baynahum bil-khayrat. Inna ka mujibu al-da'awat. Inna ka qadu al-hajat. Inna ka ala kulli shay'in qadir. Bi-rahmatik ya ar-Rahman ar-Rahimin. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.